ship docked in New York City, coming back from Africa. On board was President Teddy Roosevelt. The whole city had come out to the docks to welcome him home. He had been on a safari, a hunting safari. And when he came off the ship, the crowd went wild, and they cheered and yelled, and they were so happy to see him. Also on that ship was an old missionary who had spent over 30 years teaching God's Word in Africa. When he came off the ship and down the plank, there was no one. Nobody to say, welcome home. Nobody to cheer. And in a little fit of annoyance, I guess, he said, Father, here I have spent 30 plus years giving your word to the people of Africa. President Roosevelt has been over there killing animals, and he gets a wild reception, and I have no one to welcome me home. And in a small voice in his head, God says, but my son, you're not home yet. That's what it's like with a lot of missionaries. Assalamu alaikum. Kanaistali. Jumbo. Sawadika. Shalom. Now, if you haven't guessed, these are all ways of saying hello in several different languages. Not your ordinary, quote, easy, run-of-the-mill languages like French and Spanish or, or even German. These are somewhat exotic languages. Assalamu alaikum, Arabic. Kanaistali, Amharic. Jumbo, Swahili. Sawadika, Thai. Shalom, Hebrew. And I know, Morse code's not a language that you would learn to go overseas, but it's a language to me, and it's hello. These are some of the obscure languages that missionaries have to learn to obey God's great commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We all know the Great Commission. And they not only have to learn these languages, but also many sub-dialects, which may or may not have anything really in common with the mother tongue. And they have to learn it well enough that it becomes their first language. English needs to become their second language. They have to be able to think in that language. And they have to learn all the nuances and innuendos that can be applied by a wrong tone. For example, in Thai, which is a tonal language, if you say a certain word one way, it means grandmother. But if you use the wrong tone in saying that word, it means the rear end of a horse. Not a real good way to start a conversation with somebody. <laughs> you know, how's the rear of your horse doing? So now, a proposition. I want you to become a missionary. I want you to learn another language so well that your English is almost forgotten. Not the Romance languages that most of us know a little of, Spanish, French, Italian, although there is always a need for missionaries in those countries. No, I want you to make it a little bit harder to do what God asks. 
I want you to learn Twai, or Tagalog, or Urdu, Amhara, Bantu, or Lingala, or Arabic. And you say, okay, I can do that. I'm a smart person. What could be so hard? Maybe you can. I tried. They tried to teach me Urdu, which is Pakistani. They tried to teach me Urdu for my job before that and I went to Pakistan. I was a miserable failure because I had to translate the words that they taught me into English before I could say what they were. Chair. The word in Urdu for chair is kursil. Now, when somebody said kursil, I had to say, okay, kursil, American, that's a chair. Okay, that's a chair. Yeah, I got it. It takes way too much time. You have to think in that language. When somebody says kursil, that's it, a chair. But you don't translate it. And I always had to translate into English. I couldn't think in Urdu. And if you want to converse fluently or understand quickly, there's no time for translating. So English goes out the back door. And now comes the second part of the equation of becoming a minute of missionary. I want you to emulate Abraham. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I'm not telling you where I'm going to send you yet, but I want you to go there. So I want you to leave your mother, your father, your siblings, your children, your grandchildren, and there were many missionaries that had grandchildren back in the States. They weren't all young, young people. I want you to leave your friends, your clubs, your church, even your school. I want you to leave everything that is familiar to you and everything and everyone that you love. Pat and I had uh, friends in Ethiopia, Sam and Karen Leach. They were there for a two-year, uh, they weren't really missionaries yet. They were just there for two years to help out. And when their two years were up, they left, went back to the States. Sam was a veterinarian. They bought a veterinarian practice. They bought a house, a car. They had the American dream, everything. But they knew that that wasn't where God wanted them. They sold the practice. They sold the house. They sold the car. And the last I heard, they were missionaries in Uzbekistan. They knew where God wanted them. And it wasn't here in the quote, land of luxury. So, could you really do that if God called you? Could you say, here am I, Lord, send me? And once again, you say, sure, why not? Well, now, think about this. In a lot of places, and I want you to think of missionaries <coughs> There are plenty of missionaries in big cities, but there are also, also missionaries out in the bush. When I was in uh, Kinshasa one time, they had a meeting of Christian pygmies that came in from the bush that were taught by a missionary who lived with them. We're talking no God. No Burger King, no Winn-Dixie, no Walmart, no Publix, 
no electricity, and a lot of times no running water, no hospital if you get sick. And if there is a hospital, and it's not up to our standards, it's probably not very sterile. There was a missionary lady who had to go in the hospital, and before she went in, all of the other missionary ladies went in and scrubbed her room from top to bottom. And then one of them stayed with her all the time that she was there to make sure that it stayed clean. It don't have all the luxuries that you have here in the States. Your mail will be gone through by local authorities. No postal, uh, well you can't do that. They do what they want. You might never receive all those goodies the folks back home send you. Those care packages with Oreos and stuff like that in it. They have ways of disappearing. So you're still gone home to spread the word. These are just creature comforts. Not that important. Well, bully for you. But now comes the time to actually do what God has commanded. What you have been sent out to do. Spread the gospel. Not as easy as it sounds, even for biblical scholars such as ourselves. And I hope you understand the sarcasm there. In many countries, you won't have a building such as this one. And even if you do, you won't always be able to use it. Because if you stay in one place too long, it could be very dangerous to you and your congregation. Many local governments and religious leaders do not look kindly on what you are trying to do. The good portion of missionaries do not enter a country as a missionary. They have to come in uh, undercover, if you will. Most of them that we met were veterinarians, or they were um, farm specials, teaching people how to grow their own food and stuff like that. And while they were doing that, then they could bring up God, Jesus, being saved. And they had to do it in such a way that, you know, they had to know who they were talking to, because just wasn't safe at times. And if you want to baptize your new flock, well, in many places, you have to improvise. Baptismals are not a good thing to have in your church. Um, they're frowned on. You can't explain away a baptismal. But, you can explain away 55-gallon drums just water. We're going to use it. We're going to drink it. But you fit right in there. And they can dump you. Good Baptists. Most of the missionaries we were with were Baptists. <coughs> but now you've persevered. You've led souls to Christ. Hallelujah and glory. That brings on to the next crisis. And this is a big one. Now, you have to worry about their well-being. You have to be prepared to see those that you brought to Christ beaten, in prison, or even killed. Apostasy. Defection. An act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize a religious faith. The 
people you bring to Christ are now outcasts. Their own families will disown them. Fathers will kill their sons and daughters. Children will kill their parents. Siblings will kill siblings. Those that you brought to Christ are considered traitors. And many times the killings are sanctioned by the religious leaders and often by the government. Because you're trying to take away their religion. And there are many, many stories of people killing their own people because they have accepted Christ. They will be used as cannon fodder in wars. In Ethiopia, the new Christians were used to blow up mines. They were just lined up and had them walk out into the field going with the mines. You also have to understand that Ethiopia is a Coptic Christian nation. So now you don't have like Muslims and Christians. You have Christian brutalizing other Christians. They will be butchered and brutalized. And you, as a missionary, will not be immune. Christian missionaries have been beaten, imprisoned, and even killed for what they do. A missionary and his two sons were burned to death in their truck in India because of their teachings. And this is no isolated incident. You, as a missionary, have no real status in this country. Any country. Unlike diplomats, you have no immunity. You are at the mercy of the local governments, tribal chieftains, religious leaders, and even the local people you are trying to help and bring to God because they don't understand what you're doing. All they know is that you are attacking their culture, their religion, and you will face unbelievable misconceptions and bias. Still think you can cut it? The missionaries that Pat and I met in our travels were uh, some of the most dedicated, loving, caring people I have ever known. Many were in their designated country for upwards of 30 years. They get a furlough about every five years to go home and uh, reconnect with family. But for so many, their home and their family was the country that they were living in. The people that God sent them to. I've seen some missionaries cry to go home because their time was up. They were being called home from their country. And they actually cried because they were leaving their family and going home. Okay. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says, Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how shall they ask Him to save them unless they believe in Him. And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about Him? And how can they hear about Him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them unless someone sends them? There's your missionary. Right there. They're going, God sent them to these countries 
so that this block can be saved. That's what it means to be a missionary, to live the great commandment. Can we measure up to that? I got to tell this one little story before I go on. We had great friends that were missionaries in Ethiopia. And uh, we lived on the embassy compound. And we would have them over to play cards or just talk or whatever. And uh, when I found out that missionaries are real people, that I told them, I told them one time, I said, you know, I said, we go over to your house on the missionary compound to get away from the embassy crowd. But sometimes they're a, a real pain. And he looked at me and he said, Dave, hey, that's why we come to your house, to get away from the missionary crowd. There's always arguments and stuff, even if you were God's servant. We might not be able to measure up to be a missionary to a far off land somewhere, but you know that's okay. Because maybe our mission field is right here in the good old USA. Maybe it's right here in our own state, our own town. Or we might not have to give up all the comforts of home to spread the gospel. But we sure can share our wealth and our love for Christ with those around us. We don't even have to use words. How we live our lives is often more powerful than anything we can say. So when we leave this place, don't do a 180 and not act Christian. What you do out there is seen by a lot of people, whether you know it or not, and it can change their lives without you knowing. You just need to be ready when God calls, and He will call you. I asked Tina. One time, and then it came into a second, and then it came into a third, but I asked God put it on her heart to say yes all three times. She didn't have to do that. She was a missionary to us, and she did it mightily, and I thank you. does not have to be earth shaking. Just sharing your own experience with someone. When we accept Christ into our hearts, we all become missionaries. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers petitions and thanksgiving to be at bay on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all men, all men be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants everyone to be saved. And if that means someone has to go out into the bush and live in a grass hut with natives without electricity, without water, but they have God's Word. And that's what's going to happen. And 
Folks, it is happening. The word is being spread throughout the world. You know, we... I want to be your hands and feet. I want to live a life that leads. To see you set the captive free. Until the whole world hears, we will sing until the whole world hears. The missionaries of this world are doing a lot of singing. And when God asks you to do something, just be ready to say it. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.